So, yeah, Barry Marshall ended up winning a Nobel Prize for that. Because people didn't believe him, did they? No. In fact, uh, I, he actually ingested the bacteria himself to prove the point. Yeah, he had to be his own guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, so he had to smash the edifice of dogma and no, train thought. No, people thought he was a kook, and uh, he proved right. it, and, uh, threat, and this has become pretty established now. And Hi, welcome to the Dr. Gill Show. This is where we talk about medical matters that matter to you. My guest today is Dr. Nick Lorenz. Welcome to the show, Nick. Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Nick is a gastroenterologist. You know, I've heard uh, on ads on TV, I think for Humera, talk to your gastro. Do people call you gastro or is that a new, a new moniker? I don't hear that very often, but uh, I do hear that people have seen the, the commercials. And call you gastro. So let's talk about what is a gastroenterologist. You're clearly a medical doctor. You went to medical school. But don't you have to do a full residency training in internal medicine? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, if you have four years of medical school, then we have to do three years of internal medicine training. And after that, we apply to a fellowship. You're not guaranteed admission into a fellowship. Right. Uh, it's typically the general gastroenterology and hepatology is typically a three-year fellowship. So hepatology is in there. That means the liver. So, and I understand there's even sub-subspecialists now. You can do another year if you want to do fancy work in the bile duct and the pancreas and stuff. Is that right? Yeah, there is. There's a there's several advanced uh Year, usually they're year in, in duration fellowships. Uh, one would be involving the biliary tract. It's usually uh -huh. a combination of, of learning specialized procedures that require a, a bit more skill, a bit more dangerous also. Uh, endoscopic ultrasound, uh, the acronym would be an EUS, uh -huh. or the other acronym would be an ERCP. So with the EUS, you typically have an ultrasound probe on the tip and because of its location in the proximity you're usually obtaining ultrasound images from the stomach or from the small bowel of the duodenum you get very good visualization of the pancreas and the bile duct actually even superior to imaging from modalities such as a ct scan of the abdomen pelvis and an mr or mrcp it's the location so so close that the images are really uh, best. And often we will start, if there's a suspicion of stones, we'll often start with an EUS and we image trace the bile duct. If there's a suggestion of pancreatitis or a pancreatic mass, we'll image the pancreas. And we have the ability to, to obtain biopsies Oh, wow. So uh, so we're able to get biopsies of the pancreas. We're actually able to get biopsies of the nodes around the bile duct. We're able to oh, get my goodness. biopsies of the, actually, of the left lobe of the liver. Uh, we're uh, wow. able to biopsy the mediastinum. So a lot of times for esophageal cancers or lung cancers, we can get mediastinal biopsies. Good. Particularly. Well, that's amazing. So I'm going to stop you, Nick, and, and back up a little bit. And I just want to finish this thought. So a gastroenterologist is an, is a, the, an expert of the entire internal digestive system, which includes the esophagus, the stomach, the small bowel, the pancreas, the, the, the gallbladder, the liver, and the colon. So this is quite a specialty. Clearly, you need to be um, incredibly well-trained, very smart, and... You take care of a lot of very, very important diseases of the human body. So I want to zoom in uh, on one of the most more common things you do and something that touches the lives of most of us. Once we reach age 40 or 50, we hear the recommendation that we should have a colonoscopy. And that's done by a gastroenterologist. A colonoscopy is when you take a long black instrument. It's a little black tube and it's, it's flexible. And it goes through the bottom, into the rectum, and into the colon. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is. Now, 
in the old days, I think they did it when you were awake or mildly sedated. But but nowadays, they, they're able to put you to sleep for that procedure. Yeah, well, when I was my initial training, uh, we didn't have uh, anesthesia. Uh, we used a combination of a Valium-type medication, uh, benzodiazepam, uh, and uh, we bursed or... So you'd sedate people with intravenously, but they weren't asleep, and they could still maybe recall, and it might be uncomfortable. So uh, it, well, is mu- it, it depends on the dose of the midazolam or the Versed you gave. That medication has amnestic qualities. So, Which means you don't necessarily remember. You don't remember. So the, you know, I don't think there are people, depending on who it was, some people are easier to get more comfortable than others, but even if they were a bit uncomfortable, they typically would not remember the procedure. In fact, after you talk to them, they would call you back the next day. Oh, well, you didn't talk to me about it. So, right. so the, right. so the med- bedazolam, or what the, a lot of people call Versed, a company that used to make it, and use it now in generic quantities, but uh, uh, has amnesia for about two hours, three hours after you give it. Gotcha. If it's in large enough doses. But I just want to reassure our audience that nowadays with propofol, generally people are asleep and they really don't, don't uh, it's really not on, on a bad experience. I, I now, agree. I think it's been a big step forward. Um, the, uh, one of the uh, barriers to getting a colonoscopy is a fear that you're going to be hurt. It's gonna the be hurt. fear. Fear of hurting. Uh, and then there's also the prep involved, but the fear of hurting. And the propofol is such a good experience because it's a, it's a good sleep and people wake up refreshed. And uh, it's really made follow-up colonoscopies and compliance to follow-up so much more easier. Right. I think it's been a... Uh, a big step in order to uh, to get people to comply with the recommendations. Gotcha. Now, the reason for a was called a screening colonoscopy when you reach a, a certain age. I want you to explain that to me. Is because colon cancer is very common. I looked up uh, rates of various cancers in the United States, and as far as incidence, meaning how you know what are the numbers of cancers, skin comes in first. Then there's lung, prostate, breast, and colorectal comes in the fifth leading cause of cancer. But when you look at deaths, because skin cancer you catch early, generally you can it's very curable. As far as deaths, lung cancer causes the most deaths. But I believe, if I read correctly, colorectal cancer is number two That's for actual deaths. So mm-hmm. the reason you have you give us recommendations for colonoscopy is to screen for colon cancer. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So what are the current recommendations, Nick, that you would give a patient or a family member, someone you cared about? What recommendation would you give for a screening colonoscopy in a regular person that does not have a family history or a genetic predisposition to colon cancer? So, so the current recommendations would be to start getting screened at the age of 45. 45. Did it come down from 50? It did. Uh-huh. Um what was happening uh, over the last decade or so, most uh, we were getting decreasing rates of colon cancer in the 50, decade of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But there was a rise in colon cancer in people in their 40s, uh. which has not been well explained. But in order to, to try to mitigate and decrease that rise, the screening, uh, the, the bodies that make the policy uh. thought that decreasing at the 45 would uh, would best serve that purpose. Okay. So it's for, for screening. Now, I also see ads on TV for this thing called Cologuard, where you can take a stool sample, send it off to this lab, and they say that they can find colon cancer. To, so why do we do colonoscopies if we have this, this at-home test that you can do without anesthesia and without a bowel prep? Well, I think any method that you use for screening for colon cancer is 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 good because better than nothing. Better than nothing. Okay, it's checking for occult blood in the stool, doing a colagard. Uh, there is a a CT method called a CT colonography, or some people will call it a virtual colonoscopy. There's nothing virtual about it, but and colonoscopy. If you look at the specificity and sensitivity, so 
the chances of finding something and not having a false positive. Colonoscopy is the gold standard. Okay, so it's even better. So with the Cologuard, you're going to get some false negatives, meaning it's in there and they miss it. And you'll also get some false positives, meaning it comes back positive. You get all worried. And in fact, there's nothing. There yeah. was nothing to worry about. So the New England Journal study that most people quote uh, quoted a 13 percent. Uh, false positive. So 13% of people take uh -huh. this. We're not going to find anything. The colon cancer rates so were about, they were really pretty good, 92%. So it would miss 8% of the colon cancers. Okay. Uh, the, the real Achilles heel of the Cologuard is what we call advanced adenomas or pre, called precancerous polyps. So they don't show up on the Cologuard. They don't show up very well. Uh, I'll say anywhere between 40 to 60 percent. Uh, so a colonoscopy allows you to see polyps and catch them before they become cancers. And let me tell the audience, the cancers usually form in the polyps. Is that true? That's true. So you're putting a telescope in there. You can see these polyps. Yes. And you mentioned biopsies earlier. You can go in there with a little biopsy or a little snare or something and actually get these polyps out so they can look at them under the microscope and diagnose them very accurately. We, we try to remove them, how we call the medical term is on block, E-N-B-L-O-C. On block, if, the whole block, the no, whole bunch If of we them. can, because we don't want to leave cells behind there that could potentially be trouble. So you can get the whole thing. Usually. Usually. Now there are, um, so the only time we, unless it's a really tiny polyp, we usually don't use the cobopsies, forceps. Usually we use a snare. What is a snare? Is that a, a wire loop you put around That's it? That's a wire loop around, and we will cut it off with the wire loop. Uh, depending on the size of the polyp and the configuration of the polyp, we'll use either, some people will call a cold snare. A cold snare is just a snare with no electricity. Okay. And usually, it's getting more and more, but most of the studies are saying you can take a, a, at least a 10 to 12 millimeter polyp with a cold snare without much very safely so that's about as big as my little pinky nail here so you can just snare it and you can get the tissue so if they the, have larger polyps that have like a stock it's like and an a arterial, blood vessel a, a, an arterial that runs in it we typically like to use cautery so we go down to the base and we cauterize it to decrease the bleeding risk gotcha so the advantage of the colonoscopy you're much less likely to miss something so that would be False negatives. You're less likely to have false negative. Yeah. The other thing too is uh, your, uh, you know, ninety two percent is a good rate, but your rate with a with an experienced colonoscopist who is does a good quality exam in the setting of a good quality prep is going to be in the high nineties. Uh, so there's a little bit there, and then you also have the cost aspect of it. I the Colgard test is not. Uh, Inexpensive. I think it's okay. about six hundred dollars, and okay. it's not, and it's not the most convenient thing. You have to do a stool collection over a period of time. Right. That's not not pleasant doing a stool yeah. collection, but like we say, it's better than nothing. But what you're telling me, the numbers are a colonoscopy is superior to the cologar because it's more true positives, and you're less likely to miss a problem. And, and the other thing, it's just like one shot, shot uh, stop, uh, one shot, yeah. and you're getting. So if we find something, we're not bringing you back another time to remove yeah. the polyp. The polyp is removed in that setting. Gotcha. So it's also a convenience factor as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. So another. So I think we can say that the unpleasantness or the pain of the procedure is almost non-existent now that people are put to sleep with this propofol. Now let's talk about the prep that everybody dreads. And let me just tell you about the prep I had. I turned 50. I, I, I put it off. I put off my office staff, in fact, made the appointment for me. So I think I was about 53, 54 when I finally had, uh, I had the procedure. And I remember I had to drink many, many bottles of Gatorade and, they, and I had to mix in this powder called Miralax. I guess that's a glycol, some kind of antifreeze yeah, thing. It's polyethylene glycol. Polyethylene glycol, so you can put it in your radiator if you don't, if you, <laughs> if you have extra. And, and they gave me a couple pills to get things going. And let's just say after about a day and a half, it was pretty much Gatorade coming out the end, and it was all clear. And, and they took really good pictures, so I had to prep really 
Uh, they were very happy with the prep. So I guess if you're doing this prep, it wasn't particularly painful. It was just you, you really aren't going to work, and it really takes about a day, day and a half to, to do it right. Is that the, the general prep you recommend, Nick? Usually uh, that, that's probably the safest prep uh, from, a, from a standpoint of electrolyte balance. The polyethylene glycol does the best job of having any big fluxes in your electrolytes or renal function. All right, those are the salts in your blood, mm -hmm. and your kidneys keep your, your blood balanced in these salts. So that's the least likely to do that. So an older person maybe with bad kidneys would tolerate that better? That'd be better for somebody that's older. Now, uh, what I get, some people complain to me about is the volume. Usually it's about four liters. Yeah, it's a, it's a big jug. It's a yeah, big gallon it's four, jug. It's four liters, and it's it's inconvenient, and it's drinking a lot. Some people get some nausea. Some people get bloating. Uh, so they'll say, I would do something, but I just don't think I can handle the, the volume. Okay. And there are other things you can do. Uh, if you have good renal function, your kidneys, you don't have renal insufficiency, or um, you don't have congested heart failure. Okay. So probably the most common now is these uh, sodium picolate solutions, like Suprap. Uh, Suprap, is that a smaller volume? Yeah, so it's like, uh, so you have to drink a lot of water, but it's a 10 ounce bottle the day before and a 10 ounce bottle the day of. And then you chase that with water. A lot of water. So it's not as much volume. And then, and then there's the, uh, the the pills that you can take. It's uh, like uh, 32 pills. You have to drink with with four liters of water. That's another possibility. Okay, so, uh, so there's there, still some volume involved. Yeah, there. Uh, but the side picolate typically uh, only 20 m uh, 20 ounces of of the solution. Okay. But you still you still have to have the the, the volume to move the stool out. Okay. And so, one of the things I would since I'm going to make a push here and just please. one of the one of the things to and this has been uh, brought out is looking at the quality of the prep is important. So 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 the, with the polyethylene glycol solutions, we typically like to do a split what they call a split dosing prep. Okay. So you're taking the majority of it the day before, but you're saving 16 ounces, uh, usually two glasses uh, that morning, three hours before. That okay. little flushes some of the stuff that's residual over there and increases the quality of the prep. And and the, the better the prep is, the better quality of the exam the colonoscopist can give yeah. you. I tell, when I'm doing surgery, Nick, I say, if I can't see, I can't do good work. I mean, we got to be able yeah. to see. We do have, uh, it, it, if, if there's a liquid, we do have uh, uh, things with our scope that allow us to clean it out. But if it's solid or semi-solid, you can't deal with it. We have the ability to suction through a suction port. Correct. We actually, one of the few things, it's really been very helpful the last eight or 10 years, we have a power washer. So it's, just, <laughs> it's like a like a water pick for your teeth, except it's really powerful. And you just press, a, you, uh, there's a, a foot pedal. A foot pedal. And, foot pedal and, and, and it helps a lot. So I use okay. that a lot because I want to give the best quality exam I, I can. If there, and sometimes when you get something underneath, oh, there's a, there's a flat polyp or or a polyp that was not diff it was difficult to see because of the overlying stool, and you wash that area out and you see something. Uh, particularly, there's a type of polyp that's called a serrated polyp or serrated adenoma. They have this little mucus cap on them, and they're a lot uh, common in the right colon. So if you can wash that little mucus and stool, you can see the polyp better. So the quality of the, the, quality of the uh, prep and the, and the, the, the time that the uh, endoscopist takes to clear it out can can be quite uh, uh, yeah. important at times. Like every procedure in medicine, Nick, there's a lot of people that'll do it. There's fewer people that will do it right. So, so I don't, maybe uh, just to go in another. So we're talking about quality colonoscopy. So quality colonoscopy because you don't want somebody just going to do a colonoscopy and just tell us right and give you. So the the. the the markers for quality colonoscopy are a good prep. And then uh, there, there's another metric that we use called cecal withdrawal time. So the cecum is the very end of the, of the colon. So let's talk about it. So you go in the bottom, you go the sigmoid, 
descending, transverse, then descending, and all the way down here, it's five, six feet in there is the cecum, yeah, the very end of the, the large bowel. The very end of it. And for quality, you should spend a minimum of six minutes. I think that's not enough. I I say you spend minutes. longer. Yeah, I've, looking really carefully. But at least eight minutes. But I would say at least ten minutes. So, if if uh, your gastroenterologist is just known for whipping these things out every fifteen minutes, I'm not sure that's the best quality colonoscopy. So okay. so that's the one metric. Uh, so quality of the prep, uh, the uh, sequel withdrawal time, and and then there's another metric we're lo looking at. It's called adenoma detection rate or they call uh -huh. the acronym ADR. So there's a minimum standard that people should be getting. So the minimum standard for a screening colonoscopy should be 25%. So they look at all your cases, not that for the individual, they look at your, your body of work, let's say in a quarter or a year or something. So if you look at and let me also explain that when you get these biopsies, they go to a pathologist, they mm -hmm. look at it under the microscope, and that's where they find these adenomas or these cancers and whatnot. So let's say you have a year's worth of cases. A busy guy like mm -hmm. you is going to do hundreds, perhaps. So you can get a percentage or a statistic that you're explaining. So tell me more, please. So the the the, the so you should be picking up at least twenty percent in women and 25% oh, in men. It's even different among the sexes. Yeah, between. men have a few more polyps. And, but overall, if you, we, you know, when we do our quarterly assessments, we're looking at 25%. And if you're not getting 25%, we say, you yeah, know, maybe you should slow down on your withdrawal and maybe, you know. Uh, so there, that's the other quality aspect of it is, is how well is the endoscopist trying to look at all the walls, washing down the walls to make sure that gotcha. you're... Because the whole purpose of this is to remove the polyps, which can be leading to serious yes. malignant transformation We're in trying the future. To, you're trying to save lives, Nick. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting. We have a... I, I bet you many uh, fields have uh, these metrics. We call it internal data. For example, when I'm doing embryo transfers, we, we follow it every month or every quarter. How are we doing? Are there any issues? We try to pick up on it. So we, we have the best uh, standards of care, so, so all the, the best practices. The, the last metric I'll mention Please. is what we call sequel intubation rates. And, and this is uh, a metric that it should be around 99% or higher. So sequel intubation, may, when you start the colon, you reach the end. Okay. And typically, we like to show that we've reached the end by photo documentation. So we want to have a picture of the cecum. Okay. The appendiceal orifice is at the very the, oh, end. That's the, append the appendix comes off the cecum, so that knows you're at the very end. And the uh, opening between the small intestine and the colon, the ileocecal valve. Okay, so the end of the small bowel is the ileum. Mm -hmm. It meets the cecum there at the end, and there's a little pseudo valve, or whatever you want to call it. And so do you actually put the telescope in the ileocecal valve? We do. We try to get wow. in the terminal ileum. Maybe. And see the terminal ileum. So when it's done right by an experienced endoscopist like you, you're seeing the whole thing and getting a full evaluation. Yeah. So that's, that's the fantastic. last metric, 99% or plus uh, reaching the cecum. Because uh, a lot of times uh, there, uh, there are some – non gastroenterologists particularly in some small towns that will do colonoscopies sure. and they won't I'll see the reports that come in for a second opinion colonoscopy to 80 centimeters I don't know what that means right I right. mean because some people have a real tortuous colon you could be at 100 at right. 100 some people have you can straighten out the colon you can be at 70 centimeters and be in the cecum so um, so reaching the cecum is the other metric the fourth metric for a quality colonoscopy gotcha and I'll put in a plug for what I do, the laparoscopies, the surgeries I do for endometriosis. If they're done elsewhere, they're frequently subpar, suboptimal, and it's very disappointing to have to do it again. One more question about um, the colonoscopy. I saw somewhere, it's on, on the internet, maybe it's a, 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 an urban legend or something, but what is the 
chance of that you're transmitting disease? What's the chance that somebody's hepatitis or C. diff or some horrible bacteria on the person before you stays on the scope and you get infected from the previous, from the scope that's, it's, let me just say the scope is reused from person to person. Uh, what's the chance of catching a disease from the from the colonoscopy? It's very rare. I'd like less than one percent. Uh, we use a glutaraldehyde solution as a disinfectant, and we have scope washers as yes. as disinfectant. So is it? I've never seen it in a colonoscopy. So reassuring. So uh, <laughs> disinfection is a huge part of this. And if it, you're at a reputable place, it's busy, that it has all the right standards, all the right equipment, we shouldn't have to worry about that. Is that what you're telling me? For a colonoscopy and upper endoscopy, it's, uh, it's exceedingly, exceedingly rare. Okay, so it's nothing I mean, to worry about. Not for that. Now, I will tell you, again, I'm probably getting off course here a little bit too much, but there was a problem with another procedure, an endoscopic procedure, uh, with the biliary cases. So the, the, the scope- Going through the mouth down here, okay. Going through the mouth, into the bile duct, and into the pancreatic duct. Those, okay. have, those are technically challenging cases, and we have an extra movement. So, in a so we typically have the right and the left lever, because you're directing the tip of the scope, and you've got controls here as you advance it. Okay. So we're directing it. So we have the up and down lever, the right left lever. But with the RCP, you're putting a cath that are often a wire, and we're making cuts, putting stents in, uh. putting balloons in. So there's something called an elevator. So the elevator moves the wire up and down. So it's another control. Okay, yeah. and how did that cause infection? Be, 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 because it's hard to wash the way it's... Ah. The other ones you can really get in there and, and the scopes are, are built to really get in there, scrub it, scrub it. But to get into the elevator is difficult. So now what the, the movement's been over the last two or three years, and most everybody's gone to this, is disposable elevators. And that okay. part of the scope is disposable. And the transmission rate, which wasn't high, but it's now virtually zero because yeah. that's gone. Fantastic. So I remember uh, I asked about this before my colonoscopy, and the nurse said, your cell phone is dirtier than this scope. And I like that because there's probably tons of bacteria on this. Well, it gets I don't handled. know. If, well, I, uh, the, the, uh, the group I was with, and I did this for many years, uh, we used to wear a coat and tie. Oh yeah, and uh, and so I think it was a study about eight or ten years ago, and they started culturing the ties of doctors. It falls in. Yeah, the tie. Yeah, this is for all. This is isn't just gastroenterology. This yeah. is just going from patient to patient. The so, tie falls down and, and gets contaminated. So I stopped wearing ties. And the the other thing is the stethoscope. After I put the stethoscope. I get an alcohol wipe and I yeah. clean it off after each patient. In addition to get out of there, I wash my hands and then I get the alcohol wipe and I and I sure. clean the, the head of the stethoscope. I mean, those are the, the things that are probably the most the most contaminated as far as ability to transmit bacteria and other things. Gotcha. So we've talked about screening colonoscopy and how it's the best way to see if someone has a cancer. I'm going to assume if somebody has a family history at their high risk of it, they're going to get them sooner and more often. You have guidelines for that. But there are other diseases of the colon neck that you see on TV and you see a lot of, it seems fairly common. There's something called Crohn's disease and something called ulcerative colitis. These are diseases that cause horrible tummy aches and uh, more than just tummy aches, and uh, it really affects people's lives. Um, could you tell me a little bit about these conditions? Uh, how common are they, for example? Uh, they're, they're, the inflammatory bowel diseases are fairly common. Um, so you, the, the two major varieties are ulcerative colitis and, and Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis is, uh, and I use the word idiopathic because we don't know what's causing this. It has yeah. some autoimmune components, some genetic components, uh, some post-infectious components, but we don't actually have the mechanism narrowed down. But ulcerative colitis is a, an inflammatory condition that uh, presents uh, in 
usually it starts off in young people. So the most like teens. The, 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 there's what they call a bimodal distribution. So the okay. vast majority of people are diagnosed diagnosed between the ages of 15 and 30. Oh, uh, okay. And uh, there's another little blip, a small little blip around the 60s or 70s, uh-huh. the decade of 60s. And, and we, we don't know why that is, but that, the vast majority, I'd say 80%, 85% were, are young folks, uh, 15 to 30. So it... Ulcer colitis is a is a usually a continuous disease, so it can start in the rectum and go to the sigmoid, or it can start the rectum and go to the splenic flexure. It so can, it usually starts below and works its way up. Is that true? It's, yeah, it starts in the rectum and it's a continuous disease all the way up to the end of the colon. It's oh, confined wow. to the colon, uh, so uh, this doesn't happen very often. But if you have to remove the colon, you can live without a colon. That is technically curative. Uh, We have a lot of medications where that you don't, that's very rare that we have to do that anymore. As opposed to Crohn's disease, which can affect any part of the GI tract from the mouth to the anus. Really? The mouth? I had no idea. And and even uh, perianal outside the anus. Oh. So you can get abscess formation in there. So Crohn's disease is a full thickness disease. So as opposed to Ulcerative colitis, which is a more a superficial disease, Crohn's disease is a full thickness disease. So the, the symptoms that you typically see of ulcerative colitis would be bleeding, bright red blood per rectum, okay. diarrhea. Uh, with you Crohn's, see blood in the bowl after you, after you defecate. The more, the more common symptoms that you see with Crohn's disease would be diarrhea and abdominal pain. Now, uh, you can see abdominal pain with ulcerative colitis, but... Abdominal pain and diarrhea is much more common because of the full thickness nature of, uh, of, uh. Of, of Crohn's. You can see blood, too, but those are the most common. And, and the distribution, though I said it can be anywhere from the mouth to the anus and outside the anus, the most common areas that are involved are typically the right side of the colon huh. and the very end of the colon, the terminal ileum. So the, the very last six Over inches here. of here. With the small bowel, just before the small bowel empties into the colon. So is Crohn's disease another mystery, Nick? It is. Uh, There's been different uh, uh, theories brought out there. I think the one that I've had the strongest uh, is uh, there's some called the nod receptor. And uh, the way they process bacteria is uh, uh, altered perhaps through some biological mimicry type of mechanism. This is not clear, okay. but you get an, a, an infection with a bacteria and the receptor is faulty and it doesn't recognize it. So it, it thinks there's a chronic infection in your cold uh. or small bowel all the time. So it sets this inflammatory cascade where all these inflammatory cells are coming out there and they're attacking, your, attacking itself because it thinks that your body is under attack from an infection. Interesting, because I see these ads on TV. I think Humira is the most common. These are biological medications, and I think they modify the immune system. Don't they suppress that immune reaction? Is that how they work? Yeah, there, there's, a, there's been a hu- inflammatory bowel disease has been a huge advancement in what we can offer the patient. I can remember well, the I'm, medications for that. For the medications. The yeah, when I started my fellowship, we had <laughs> prednisone, which is a Terrible medication in the long in the long term. For long term, yeah, it's a, what's called a glucocorticoid. It's like cortisol suppresses the immune system everywhere with all those side effects. Okay. And we had uh, sulfasalazine. Is that a pill? It's, it was a pill. It was a pill initially used to treat arthritis in the fifties, and then noticed that it helped people who had inflammatory bowel disease. Uh huh. And so the problem with the sulfasalazine initially was that it had a sulfa moiety. So Sulfasalazine had, I'm getting too technical here, but it had a bond that was cleaved in, in the bowel, release the five amino psilocyc acid, and the okay. sulfa did nothing except cause allergy problems. So uh-huh. they now have a series of medications that we use mostly for ulcerative colitis called mesalamine. And it's kind of like an aspirin? It's kind of like an aspirin. And okay. it's, it's a topical medication. That's for very mild cases of of uh, ulcerative colitis. But these biologics, these new biologics, they happen to be in- injectable, I believe, and they happen to be very expensive. 
So there's different ways of administration of this. There, uh, with the large molecules, uh, you give them intravenously or you can give them subcutaneously. So the very first- But it's a needle. It's an it's injection. A needle. The very first of those medications uh, was a medication called infliximab. Uh, the company came out with it was, it was Remicade, and it's an uh, anti Remicade, okay. That was first, and then Humira came next, but it's an uh, anti-tissue necrosis drug, or anti-TNFs, and that was administered intravenously uh, based on weight, uh, usually every eight weeks, five milligrams per kilo, but you can do it up to four weeks and 10 milligrams per kilo. Then Humira came out, which is usually administered subcutaneously with a little shot, a little needle. Okay. It, Usually every other week, 40 milligrams, but sometimes if it, things get bad, you can't give it every week. So that's a class of drugs called anti-tissue necrosis or anti-TNFs. And it has helped a lot of people? It ha has helped and a lot. And it's changed the treatment? Definitely. There's other types of drugs that have really helped all, all inflammatory bowel disease. Next in that series is a small molecule. Uh, the medicine is called uh, betaluzumab or in tibio, you probably seen in tibio, people. okay, and that's an alpha four, beta seven, and tagrin that that's pretty gut specific. It's like, ah. it's not as widespread, so it's pretty much hitting these receptors in the gut. And then you have the interleukins, the the Stellaris, which works on interleukin twelve and interleukin twenty three. All right, interleukins are inflammatory signaling molecules, and you can inhibit them, I guess. You can hit them, and the 12 and the 23, particularly the 23, seems to be involved with inflammatory bowel disease. So Stellar is one, and then the new one has been Skyrizi, which is just an IL-23. Ah. You may see those commercials. On I'm the, I, I know them from the commercials. And, and then you have the JAK inhibitors, J-A-K, or Janus, uh, Janus kinase inhibitors. Uh, uh, a lot of this developed through the... Uh, uh, through the rheumatological data and then GI incorporated. Rheumatology is where doctors mainly do uh, like arthritis and, and autoimmune conditions, but it, it's cross pollinating with your specialty. And so the, the JAK1, JAK3, uh, Cell Jans was the first one. Now there's just a JAK3 by itself called Rimvoke. And, those, ah. and these are pills. Ah, okay, so they're not injectable. Very expensive, but they're revolutionizing it. So just with the, f the final point on this, to make these diagnoses, they have to see a gastroenterologist who's going to take a little biopsy, a little sample to make the diagnosis. Yeah. So they need to see you. Very good. So let's change course now, Nick. We've talked about putting the telescope up the bottom. You can put telescopes down the mouth into the upper Gastro into and, and gastrointestinal tract, can't you? Yeah, we, we do that quite frequently. Okay, so about equal, about equal. You go. I would say probably colonoscopy is a little bit more common, but yeah, close. But a busy gastroenterologist like you is putting scopes in both ends all the time. Yeah, yes. So sir. what what are the reasons you might put a scope in, in someone's mouth down to their stomach? And once again, under these new anesthesias, these where where they're asleep. And one of the one of the things <laughs> about the upper endoscopy that might be is that you don't have to prep the way. No you prep. Do. You just have to have an empty stomach. Yeah, you, nothing you, you to eat or drink uh, for at least six or eight hours. So they put you to sleep, put a telescope down there, way, and the the reasons for that would be uh, if somebody is having severe heartburn or okay. severe indigestion, pain up in here, dyspeptic symptoms. Okay. That, uh, particularly if they're a smoker, if they're taking medications, arthritic type medications that we call NSAIDs, or non steroidal what? inflammatories like aspirin, ibuprofen, ibuprofen right? Uh, Aleve, that sort of thing, meloxicam. Uh, and another reason for doing the endoscopy is people will have problems of food getting stuck. Ah, uh -huh, so sw swallowing something feels like it's not going down like it used to. Better take a look. A lot of times uh, people develop narrowings uh, from the acid causing scar tissue or stricture formation uh -huh. or ring formation. Uh, young people, <laughs> one of the things that's been happening a lot in the last uh, 10 to 15 years that we're finally getting a, a grasp on it. Before we, wasn't, we didn't know what exactly it was, but there are some people that get an allergic type of esophagitis we call it eosinophilic esophagitis huh. and they'll present with solid food and patchen a lot and these are young people using 20s or 30s they usually have some sort of other uh, skin problem uh, asthma some sort of allergic 
type condition. It's called eosinophilic esophagitis, and they usually will have they'll present to the ER, and you're coming in, and they're having chest pain. And it's stuck. It's stuck, and we have to get it out. That's what an impaction is. Now, what's going on with ulcers nowadays? Are they still as common as they used to be? Um, so back in the 80s, um, if, if this is too detailed, let me know, but there was a uh, kind of revolutionary. Uh, there was a, a, a guy named uh, Barry Marshall, who was a gastroenterologist in Australia. Ah. And he, he did some, so I forget what part of Australia, but he did some work with a pathologist called Warren, where they looked at uh, people that had ulcers, and they found this bacteria. So they would buy it, so they'd put the scope in, see an ulcer, this eroded patch here. He would take a little biopsy of it and look at it under the microscope. And what did they see? Well, they, they saw a bacteria that was able to live in this very hostile environment ah, of the stomach. People used to think the stomach was sterile for the most part, it, didn't they? Except for this bacteria, it pretty, it pretty well is. It's very high concentration of hydrochloric acid. Well, normal hydrochloric acid, but the bacteria has had some evolutionary changes that allow it to exist in this mucus layer because it produces uh, ammonia. Ah, uh, a base, so it could neutralize its, right. its, its, its little environment. So they did biopsies and they saw helicobacters. So uh, yeah, so there are several ways of picking it up. You can do a silver stain and you can see it. The cheaper way is to check for the ammonia. Uh, and you just put it in a well and you check for it and uh, it, it turns it positive. So that kind of threw everything on its, uh, turned everything on its head because people used to think it was just stress and you cut down the stress and ulcers go away, right? Yeah, so uh, so yeah, Barry Marshall ended up winning a Nobel Prize for that. Because people didn't believe him, did they? No. In fact, uh, I, he actually ingested the bacteria himself to prove the point. Yeah, he had to be his own guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, so he had to smash the edifice of dogma and no, train thought. No, people thought he was a kook, and uh, he proved right. it, and, uh, threat and this has become pretty established now, and he ended up getting the, the Nobel Prize in, in medicine for it. You know, I'm just going to take this moment, Nick, just to emphasize that there's something in the blood called homocysteine oh, that yeah. causes terrible vascular disease, yeah. and the cholesterol-only people hated him, and... Uh, Oh, 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 I'm forgetting his name. Um, oh, it'll come to me in a second. Um, but he was ostracized because he was breaking the mold. And the, the doctors that have found out that dietary fat and cholesterol are not bad for you, they, they, they get, you know... They get marginalized and all that stuff. McGinty, I think, may have been McGinty, the, yeah. the, the homocysteine guy. So medicine is replete with exam. And let's not forget Semmelweis, who realized that washing your hands might prevent inf spreading infection to yeah. women in labor. So then he, he, he died crazy and broke because they, they broke him. So <laughs> fresh thinking and new disruptive thinking in medicine is not always uh, welcomed, is it? No, I, I mean, there's... Paradigms are sometimes hard to break or hard to modify when you have this is, you know, you typically doctors have this conservative mindset and you really have to, you know, you have to really show them there's a, there's a certain amount of skepticism, which is a little bit of skepticism is good, but too much skepticism, you know, that, that, that good balance there between, you know, but it was, re it was reproducible. All science is reproducible. Right. It, the truth should out if people keep an open mind. Yeah. Kilmer McCulley. McCulley. Who? Uh, and he won a Linus Pauling Award uh, for uh, discovering that homocysteine was one of the things that caused vascular disease. Much worse than cholesterol. Okay, so we'll move on. So with an upper GI, you can diagnose problems of the esophagus that you just mentioned. You can diagnose problems in the stomach, such as ulcers, but you can keep going. So after the stomach is the duodenum, the upper part of the uh, small bowel, about 12 inches long. That's where the, the, the word duodenum comes from. It means parts of 12. And then there's a duct that comes in the duodenum that comes from the pancreas and the liver via the gallbladder. So that's still, 
in the purview of a gastroenterologist such as you. Yes. So help me here. I see more and more patients who have had their gallbladder removed. Is there an increase in gallbladder disease, do you think, Nick, possibly due to changes in diet? Or is it just so much easier to remove a gallbladder now? General surgeons can do it in about 15, 20 minutes. Is it just so easy to do now that people are losing their gallbladders just out of a expediency? Well, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the data suggests that it's related to blood uh, BMI or body mass index. So, Meaning if you're overweight, more likely to... But I've seen slender patients, yeah. Nick, and their teens get their gallbladders out before they come see me for fertility issues. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have a good physiological explanation for that. But if you look at the, the people that I see, typically they're overweight, and you're changing the composition of the bile salts. So it's... Oh. So, so you're, the cholesterol levels go up the fat goes up and you're changing the ability for the bile to stay in solution. And so you get increased crystallization of the bile. And ah. then you have the nidus formation of the crystal and you get more and more formation. So it's related. Uh, I'd say the vast majority, I can't say all of it because as you see, uh, you said there's thin people getting it. Sure. Some people just have a, uh, a, a, a bowel composition that predisposes them to that, but but weight is usually the driving factor, the BMI and the uh, elevated cholesterol levels. I see, I see. So I I I had no idea that bile composition could change, or that makes a lot of sense. So well, there's I don't want to get too many, but there's what? there's a I think, uh, I think it's called in Tobin's triangle, where the bile salt ratios to fat. To fat and whatnot. Yeah. And this is not saying cholesterol is bad, but bile salts are detergents. Let me just explain this to people. Bile salts are detergents that come in the duodenum when you eat a meal. It allows the fats to dissolve and you can absorb them, get the vitamins and all that kind of stuff. And this detergent is made primarily from cholesterol. So this is where cholesterol is a good thing. It's just that the you're, you're telling me that these ratios and these, con these composition changes can create these crystals and these stones mm -hmm and take out the gallbladder. So as a gastroenterologist, you're not taking out gallbladders, are you? I am not. Uh, I think our role usually involves uh, some of the other sequelae that are associated with, with gallbladder gotcha. disease. Typically, uh, we get involved, if it's a routine standard gallbladder that doesn't have any complications, then we're usually not involved with general surgeon. All of them sure. just do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So the general but, surgeons I know are very busy. They do lots and lots of these gallbladders. It's very simple. It's very safe. And um, I, I guess that's a good thing. We typically get involved when you have the migration of the, and this sometimes the picture is worth a thousand words, but get the migration of the stone out of the gallbladder into the common uh, duct. So the stones can migrate down this duct and through the pancreas where it's pretty tight, isn't it, Nick? Yeah. So it one scrape its way through. So one of the things that can happen is the stone gets stuck in the common bile duct and you get jaundice because the uh, bile cannot get out and gets into your skin. And your skin backs up. It's supposed to be coming out that way and yeah. it gets backed up into yeah. the liver. Again. The bile is what gives the stool its color. So That's why it's brown. So if you see people that are complaining of light-colored, chalky-type stools, it uh -huh. usually is a result of some sort of biliary obstruction. Interesting. The gray stool color is not brown anymore. And so the other thing that you can see is uh, the urine trying to eliminate this so that the, when you get the, uh, uh, an obstruction, the urine turns really dark. So it tries to come out another way. It tries to find another way. But you, so you can get the blockage of the bile duct. And what happens is that since it's stagnant, you can get bacterial growth in there and what they call cholangitis or inflammation of the colon. And what we get called in a lot of times if there's, there's a stone in there, it's difficult to get to that stone surgically. It's a much more involved procedure. So we have that special scope that we're able to get into wow. the opening uh, of the bile duct. And we put a little wire in there and then we put a little 
classic catheter and we shoot oh my contrast and we shoot uh-huh. and we see we get and take it, x-rays take x-rays and we see what it looks like and a lot of times so a stone will look like a since it's radio opaque it'll look like it's dark so everything okay. around it so you see a stone in there and we have little devices we can put in there we have a little thing that's got a little wire we like okay. to make a little cut around 12 one o'clock position because where the opening, which is called a papilla, is oriented. There's no blood vessels there in that orientation. So we make a cut in there, and that's called the sphincterotomy. That sphincterotomy lets us work better because it gives us room so we can put baskets in there, grab the stone. Just like the urologist. They get yeah. stones out of the ureter. You can get stones out of the bile duct. Or we put a balloon, and we drag it out. Oh, wow. So if there's a cancer in the bile duct, we can actually put two types of stents Stent is a plastic tube that holds it tube, open. Holds it open. So if, uh, sometimes, very rarely, but when the first started the laparoscopic cholecystectomy, there used to be leaks. So we put a stent in there to decrease the pressure, let the leak seal, and we uh-huh. could take it out in three months. If there's a cancer in there, we actually can put a metal stent, which is more permanent. So it starts off at a certain size, and over the course of the day, it gets to its full size, so the person can have drainage. Uh, because unfortunately, that's that's pretty much a alleviating sort of a temp, uh, that it's we don't have a palliative. It yeah. gets you through palliative. Yeah, it's just going to get you through. So we have that ability, and also uh, we are also, as I said, we can image the pancreas and see if there's any masses or cancer there which with is, an ultrasound at the very end of the scope. So you, right. with this is true with all ultrasounds. The closer you can get to the target. Generally, the better the picture you can get. And for some reason, the pancreatic tissue seems to be really good for <laughs> You get really good definition uh, at, at those levels with the scope. Uh, it's just uh, the physics of it is uh, just really good for imaging the, the pancreas. Fantastic. Well, obviously, Nick, it takes a whole lifetime to become an expert in gastroenterology, and I would love to talk about the pancreas and whatnot, but this would would go on too long. So I would like to finish up our talk today about hepatitis, viral hepatitis. And let me just say that um, when we, you and I were younger, hepatitis B, particularly hepatitis C, was frequently fatal. It was a horrible disease. People would get cancers of the liver from these viruses and whatnot. And there have been some revolutionary changes in the two types of viral hepatitis. Can you can you start out maybe with hepatitis B and we'll we'll end with hepatitis C? Yeah. So yeah, hepatitis B is uh, probably the most common worldwide. It's transmitted by a virus, easily transmitted via sex, delivery, maternal during the delivery it can be transmitted, um, and with the intravenous drugs sharing. The intravenous drugs and the, the in a lot of the Asian countries it is passed from mother to the fetus. The child said. during delivery. During delivery, uh, we actually try to give them like eight, uh, immunoglobulins before that, which is very successful. H big uh, to try to prevent that. That that if you ever hear the the term vertical transmission, okay, that's from mother to child, uh, and that's what happens a lot. It's a but uh, hepatitis B is a uh, DNA virus. Okay, so. Um, uh, so young kids who develop B are more likely to get, who, who contract B, are more likely to get a chronic infection. Chronic and, hepatitis. Uh, if you get it at an older age, the chronicity rates are about 5%. We have chronicity a, meaning you've got it for long standing, long term. And one of, the, one of the problems with hepatitis B is that it can actually incorporate it into the human genome and increases the risk of liver cancer. Yeah, and that happens with cervical cancer as well. The bad types, the bad strains actually get into they, your DNA. They integrate into the integrate. into the, the hepatocytic DNA and, okay. and can do that. There are medications out there, uh, several series of medicines that help uh, uh, cure hepatitis B. I will say the cure rates are not anywhere near as good as hepatitis C. But they, they, we are getting better with that. So hepatitis B is get the, the treatment of hepatitis B is getting better and better. And once again, an experienced gastroenterologist. And I know some some 
uh, gastros like treating it and they have experience. Some don't, but they'll usually have a partner or a colleague yeah. that has more experience with the viral hepatitis uh, treatments. So hepatitis C is, is an RNA virus. It's a, okay. a small virus. And uh, it's a sneaky one because you don't know you have it necessarily. It's less or sometimes asymptomatic. Isn't yeah, that true? It, it is. And so the other type of hepatitis was A, and there's B and there's C. But for a while, we knew that something was transfusion-related before we could check for it. And in the 80s, this was called non-A, non-B, which uh -huh. we have subsequently been able to isolate, and it's hepatitis C. So hepatitis C in the 90s was so difficult to treat. We started with short-acting interferons at huge doses three times a week, which caused terrible depression, terrible psychiatric, uh, psychological and psychiatric issues. Uh, and then we went to the pegulation where it was long acting. Then we added rivavirin. Then we added the uh, different types of medication. Now we have a cocktail where they have several types of medications together. And the and cure rates are like 98%. That is remarkable. So it went from virtually untreatable, mm -hmm. slow, miserable death sometimes, liver cancers and whatnot, especially when it was with B. And now, and then the interferon. So now we are, we're having the pills advertised on TV, and we're actually getting cure, high cure rates. Yeah. So, uh, so it used to be that the most tra liver transplants were done for hepatitis C. Okay. And that's no longer the case. Oh, that's so that's measurable. That's a dramatic yeah, improvement. So the, yeah. So uh, the vast majority of of transplants now are for uh, NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or fatty liver. Fatty liver. So that's kind of replaced that, and that's in epidemic proportions. Be, again, because of our as as a society, our body mass indexes are going up, our BMIs are really going up, and so the incidence of fatty liver is going up. But we are able to cure hepatitis C ninety-eight percent of the time. That that is just spectacular. If that doesn't give you optimism and hope that modern medicine is continuing to make amazing strides. I don't know what will, because that is, in our lifetimes, in our careers, Nick, we have seen it go from just devastating to curable. Mm -hmm. And then now it's right at like HIV. Yeah, now HIV. people are living full lives, undetectable, with these, these pill regimens that keep yeah. it in what was once a horrible disease, now keep it in check. Remarkable, just remarkable progress. Yeah, we have seen amazing changes and developments in our in our careers, Nick. So, are there any things about gastroenterology about your field that you feel are misunderstood or underappreciated that you would like to leave? Any parting words you'd like to leave with our audience about your amazing specialty of medicine? Well, uh, w one of the things that attracted me to uh, to gastroenterology because it was a procedural oriented specialty but it also had your chronic patients mm -hmm. so it was a good for me it was a good blend of a procedural especially that you actually follow people long term as well and uh, being an actual internal medicine doctor well an internist yeah, with, with a little too. but it's you don't want to my wife's an internal medicine doctor that okay. was really hard to be All right, we'll internal be, we'll medicine doctor. that's that's why i went into uh gastroenterology because i wanted to define my i didn't think a uh, I could handle it all also, but yeah, but within certain confines, you st you still have that pa that patient uh, interaction, and you, I have people that I've taken care of for twenty years, but then again, I have people that come in all the time for screening colonoscopies. I see once a year, I'm uh, sorry, once every ten years, right, right. And so it's that 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 good blend. Uh, uh, one of the things uh, is that we are uh, there's an undersupply of gastroenterologists. So uh, I would say people get frustrated at us. That we there aren't enough of you. So there's long waiting lines, there, there's, wait, wait lists and lines. So I think one of the biggest things I hear is it's so hard to get in to see you. And uh, I, I think there's about 625 GI fellows a year uh, or 630. Uh, and that's it. That's not enough. And almost and, that many retire every year probably. And so we've had to bring in some mid-levels, which I don't really like because I like to take care of them. Anyway, but in order to meet the office needs, um, and I, I know we've had some success recruiting. A lot of people have it. I just, uh, Becker's, which is one of the big magazines there that does uh, quantitative stuff on doctors that, that 
the hardest subspecialty to recruit right now is gastroenterology. I'm sure that'll change, but but uh, so I want to apologize to my the patients out there that are okay. waiting for an office visit that are waiting to have their scopes. Why do I have to? Uh, why is this taking four weeks? And I, I can I have it done next week? And it's it's just a, uh, a manpower, woman power issue just uh, just not enough I think and that's also a great other, point Nick the other aspect I'd like to think is we're an aging population and sure and so we're requiring these services more and then we also lower the screening ages for colonoscopy so I, I would like to apologize to all our <laughs> patients there please have patience with us uh, we're, we're trying to do the best we can I know it's frustrating well we have the same thing in uh, reproductive endocrinology they only make 40 of us every year yeah. and i'm sure that many retire so yeah, there's supply and demand issues we're doing our best yeah well nick thank you i have learned so much from this thank you for your time and thank you for being such a wonderful uh, physician in our community well, thank you it's a pleasure